Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on OCR, carbonyl compounds. So this video is dedicated specifically to OCRA, so if you're studying this exam board at A-Level Chemistry, then all the content here is completely relevant to you, nothing more and nothing less. Um, so what I ask you to do is just subscribe to my channel because all of this is free. It's not just this video, but there are loads of other videos for the full range of the OCR content that you need to know for your exam. Um, so please subscribe. Um, there's no cost for it. That's um, That'll be massively helpful to show you support. Um, these PowerPoints, if you like your own private copy of these PowerPoints, then they're all available to purchase on the link in the subscribers in the subscribers box, in the description box below. Um, all of that information is there, so just click on that. Like I say, these videos are designed to um, as revision. Um, so you may have um, looked at this already in school or college, or you may be studying it on your own as a as an independent um, candidate. Um, so therefore, um, the information here may be quite new to you, but it still informs you of all the information that you that you need for it. Um, it is one thing knowing the content; you've got to be able to do your uh, exam practice as well. Um, so just make sure that um, you're practicing um, thoroughly with exam papers and um, if you're unsure on the technique that you need to adopt then I have done videos on exam technique um, on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel so just go and have a look there um, and remember to subscribe did I say that already <laughs> right okay so like I say this matches the specification um, directly to OCRA so it contains reactions of carbonyl compounds and characteristic text uh, tests for carbonyl compounds as well so the test you can do so it's quite a short topic um, but there's some mechanisms in here that you need to know of course okay so let's start with aldehydes and ketones so aldehydes and ketones have the carbonyl functional group which is c double bond o and the difference between an aldehyde and a ketone is the position of the carbonyl group which is the c double bond o group so aldehydes they have the carbonyl group on the end and they always have an ending of al so ethanol ethanol methanol propanol etc etc so here's an example. This is propanol. So you can see propanol um, has two carbons in it. So we call it prop. And because it has the carbonyl group at the on the end carbon, um, we call this propanol. This one is ethanol. Um, so it has three carbons, the first one. Uh, this second one has two carbons. Um, so this is called ethanol, which is CH3CHO. So you can see how it's um, written out as a displayed formula um, and as a structural formula as well. Whereas ketones, they have their carbonyl group on an inner carbon, um, and they all end in own. So, for example, this one's called propanone, and this one is called pentan 2 own So, with uh, ketones, you have to be able to name them properly. So, you can see here that we've got um, a, a ketone in the second carbon here. So, this is pentan 2 own um, but you've got five carbons, hence why it's called pent. So make sure you're familiar with how they look and the naming of them as well. Okay, so aldehydes, they can be readily oxidized. However, ketones can't be oxidized. So aldehydes are oxidized to carboxylic acids, um, and um, we use an oxidizing agent to be able to do that. So for example, here's your aldehyde here. It's been oxidized, and you notice that we're using the oxidation symbol you can see here. So we're using that to symbolize an oxidizing agent. So it's just O in a square bracket. And then we form our carboxylic acid there at the end. Ketones are not oxidized at all. So they, so there we are, so it's just a cross. So they can't be oxidized at all. So if you add an oxidizing agent to a ketone, um, you don't get any, uh, any further reaction with that one. Okay, so Tollens reagent. This can be used to distinguish between aldehydes and ketones. Um, so uh, Tollens reagent is a um, is a nice uh, is a nice colourful um, a, a colourful uh, reagent to use to test it. But the Tollens reagent has to be made first to be able to distinguish between an aldehyde and a ketone. So your Tollens is a um, it, you get this nice uh, silvery colour that comes out uh, comes out at the end. It's really good. So anyway, what we're going to make first is silver nitrate solution. So that's colourless. So we um, not make it. We pour it into the test tube. I don't know how you, don't know how you would, uh, how you could, you, well, you wouldn't want to make it. You can actually buy it. Um, so silver nitrate solution, you add that into your test tube. Then we add a few drops of sodium hydroxide and we form a pale brown precipitate that forms. So we add that until we see that precipitate. 
Um, then we add a few drops of dilute ammonia to that until that precipitate dissolves. And then what we've made there in our test tube is Tollens reagent. So then what we do is we add our aldehyde or ketone, depending on obviously what we're testing, to the Tollens reagent and we place it in a hot water bath as you can see, as you can see on there. And um, we don't use a Bunsen burner because aldehydes and ketones are flammable and the last thing you want to do is to have a test tube with an aldehyde and ketone there with a naked flame underneath and you end up with fire coming out the top of your test tube and you end up with all sorts of all sorts of problems. So <coughs> sorry. So use a water bath. Um, it's a lot safer to use a water bath. So Tollens contains this complex, so it's AgNH32. So remember what a complex looks like. So you've got your silver in the middle and your ammonia ligands um, around the side. This is a different complex because it's a linear one. We've only got two ligands around here for this one. Um, it's added to warm. It's added warm, um, and we add it to aldehydes. And if there's an aldehyde present, we get a silver mirror. It's also known as a silver mirror test. Um, and if we get ketones, if we've got ketones in there, then we get no precipitate at all. So we don't see any visible change if there's a ketone. So this test is really good for distinguishing the difference between aldehydes and ketones. So Brady's reagent, or 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, try and say that one quick, or 2,4-DNP, uh, can be used to distinguish between aldehydes and ketones. So Brady's reagent is dissolved, this is how you make it, so Brady's reagent is dissolved in concentrated sulfuric acid and methanol. Okay, so we dissolve them in that, and then it's added to the, sum, the substance under test, depending on what we're testing here. If a carbonyl group exists, then a bright orange precipitate is formed and it only reacts with C double bondos in aldehydes and ketones, not in carboxylic acids. So that actually this statement, um, uh, this statement here is not to distinguish between aldehydes and ketones, that should be to distinguish between carbonyl, uh, carbonyl groups, but only in aldehydes and ketones. Um, it's this bright orange substance um, and it's a derivative um, of a carbonyl compound uh, and different carbonyl compounds produce different derivatives. So it depends on, on, on what you're reacting it with. Um, so they have different melting points and they can be identified against a library of known melting points. So what we can do um, is we can take that and put it into a, um, a, a device that measures melting points um, and we can um, distinguish uh, what type of uh, substance we may have, what if it's an aldehyde, uh, if it's a ketone, depending on what, what the aldehyde is. Okay, so when we're saying um, distinguishing between that, it's about trying to identify what these compounds are, what the aldehyde is and what the ketone is. So aldehydes and ketones, they can be reduced to form primary and secondary alcohols. So reducing agents such as sodium borohydride, um, or also known as sodium tetraboro, uh, sorry, sodium, sodium tetrahydride, uh, borate, borate, so say three, um, if I can spit that out, is dissolved in methanol and water. It's easier just to say sodium borohydride. Um, dissolved in methanol and water and can reduce aldehydes and ketones. Okay, so it's common to represent reducing agents as H in the square bracket. So just like we've seen oxidizing agents are represented in a square bracket, which is O, okay, we represent reducing agents as H. Um, and um, this is then used to reduce your substances. So, for example, here we've got an aldehyde here. So this is um, this is propanol, which is here. We react it with our reducing agent, and then we form our alcohol. Now, you might think, well, why do we use a two here? Why do we have two H? And the reason is because we need two lots of reducing agent to produce two hydrogens to make it into the alcohol. So we need one hydrogen to go here, which is this bit here. And we need uh, one hydrogen to attach onto the oxygen, which goes here. So that's why we need two H. So make sure these are balanced. Uh, ketones are reduced to secondary alcohols. Exactly the same. So we've got two hydrogens there. So one hydrogen goes onto the oxygen and one hydrogen goes down there, as you can see. So um, the mechanism showing how hydride ions, so H minus ions, uh, are produced by the reducing agent, how that reduces aldehydes and ketones to primary and secondary alcohols respectively. So um, the mechanism is the same um, for aldehydes and ketones, there's no difference here. So here we've got the H minus sign, so that H minus sign comes from the reducing agent that, we, that we're doing, so, <coughs> sorry, that we're using, 
So we've got H minus, lone pair of electrons, they go into that delta positive carbon there, and then that um, then has a knock-on effect in terms of breaking that double bond, which is there. So it breaks that double bond and the electrons jump onto the oxygen there. So remember, from year one chemistry, you need to know how to use um, curly arrows and mechanisms. Um, it's very important. Um, so in other words, uh, arrows must show direction of electron travel. So it goes from the lone pair here into the carbon. Uh, it breaks that double bond uh, and then onto the oxygen there. So then we form this substance, which is here. Um, this is our intermediate. We've got a lone pair on the oxygen that's remaining because the electrons have jumped from um, one of the double bonds, from the double bond here into the oxygen. So it's now a single bond. And then these electrons from here then go and attack the H plus ion. That comes from acid or water that was added um, to the reducing agent at the start. So remember, it's about trying to make sure that we've got enough uh, H plus ions in there to allow this step to, to occur. And then finally, we form our product which is our primary alcohol in this case because we've used an aldehyde. But like I say, the mechanism is the same for ketones as well. Ketones obviously just secondary. Second, for the form secondary alcohols. Okay, so let's have a look at the interaction between potassium cyanide and a carbonyl group. So potassium cyanide reacts with the carbonyl group to form hydroxynitriles. So the reaction occurs via nucleophilic addition. Um, and so this means a nucleophile, which is your CN minus ion, um, normally you would get that from something like potassium cyanide or hydrogen cyanide, but hydrogen cyanide is quite difficult to use, but um, that's where it comes from. And it attacks the carbonyl group, adds on, and makes a hydroxynitrile. And all a hydroxynitrile is, is just a, a compound that has a hydroxy group, which is OH, and a nitrile group, which is CN. So potassium cyanide is used to produce the CN minus ions. Potassium cyanide is easier to use because it's easier to handle, it's safer to use, and you can dissolve it um, quite readily. In this case, we dissolve it in acidic solution, and it produces the following ions. So we produce our K plus and CN minus ions here. So there's your K plus, and there's your CN minus ions that are produced. So here, the CN minus ions comes from potassium cyanide and is a nucleophile. So remember, a nucleophile means nucleus loving. So itself will have um, a lone pair of electrons. So you can see here, I've got a lone pair of electrons here. And these, if you think about your mechanism, these will then move onto the delta positive carbon, which will then break that double bond. So let's have a look. So there we go. Okay, so the positively charged carbon um, uh, the positive charge carbon is attacked by the cyanide uh, and the lone pair of electrons are donated from the CN minus ion, as you can see. And then immediately the two electrons from the double bond transfer to the oxygen. So that's the first step that we've got to do. So very similar to what we've seen before with um, other reactions of carbonyl compounds. So like I say, we can use hydrogen cyanide, but it's easier to, um, it's easier to use potassium cyanide, but we've got to dissolve it in um in in acid for potassium cyanide but we don't need to do that for hydrogen cyanide because it already has a supply of h plus ions okay so as the potassium cyanide um is used uh as the potassium cyanide used sorry is acidified then we have a ready supply of h plus ions because we've acidified it so same reaction happens already with the oxygen that's got the lone pair of electrons that reacts with the h plus ion and then what we form is our hydroxynitrile, which is formed there, as you can see. So the mechanism is very similar to the other reactions that you may have seen. So the overall generic equation for an aldehyde is you've got your aldehyde here, which is RCHO, adding your potassium cyanide and your H plus ions is because we've dissolved it in an acid, uh, and that forms our um, aldehyde, uh, sorry, our hydroxynitrile, which is here, um, and K plus. So a hydroxynitrile will be on a terminal carbon if it's reacting with an aldehyde. Now with a ketone, it's exactly the same, um, except we form our hydroxynitrile in a middle carbon instead, um, but the reaction is very similar. Um, and if we use an unsymmetrical ketone or an aldehyde, so apart from methanol, then we, what we do is we get in a mixture of enantiomers are produced. Um, and, and this is uh, seen in the optical isomerism topic um, that you will have seen um, or that you may have seen uh, already. 
Okay, so when we use potassium cyanide, um, we need to assess the risks when using it. Um, and you need to be aware of some of these risks when using uh, potassium cyanide, because as you, as you may know, cyanide is not particularly good for you. So potassium cyanide is an irritant. Um, it's very dangerous if it's ingested or hit or inhaled, but it's got to be better than hydrogen cyanide, which is a gas, and it's much more difficult to control. That's why we prefer to use potassium cyanide. Um, when it reacts with moisture, um, it can form uh, hydrogen cyanide gas, so we've got to keep it dry. Um, and to reduce the risks, we need to do the following. So we need to take some precautions um, using personal protective equipment, so PPE, um, and using um, uh, lab uh, equipment to help protect us as well. So for example, we need to wear gloves when we're handling chemicals like this. Um, we need to wear safety goggles at all times, that would be the case for anything, any type of reaction. Um, you wear a lab coat, that just prevents contamination on your clothing, so it's to protect your, protect your clothing. Um, and ideally, um, we'd use a fume cupboard to prevent exposure to toxic fumes. Now this is only relevant if there's moisture, if it's in a quite a damp area and you're getting hydrogen cyanide. You don't want to breathe in hydrogen cyanide. It is horrendously acidic and it's toxic, so that's not a good idea to breathe that in. Okay, and that's it. So a nice short topic on carbonyl compounds. Um, like I say, there's a full range of OCR videos, revision videos available on Allery Chemistry um, YouTube channel. So just go and have a look on there. Please subscribe. They're all for free. Um, your subscription is is more than enough um, just to show you support for the channel. Um, these PowerPoints are available to download as well. Um, so if you can purchase them, click on the link in the comments box. Um, but that's it. Okay, bye-bye.